Today we are talking about having ourselves committed to forgiveness. We spent the past two Sundays talking about having ourselves committed in other ways. The first Sunday in May, we joined with the confirmands and committed ourselves to Christ as they stood up and said, we believe in Jesus and we want to be a part of his church. Last Sunday for Mother's Day, we talked about the commitment of family and having ourselves committed the way Ruth and Naomi were committed to one another and how God will use the commitment to family to bring about blessing. Today, as we talk about forgiveness, we are looking at Genesis chapter 33, verses 1 through 4, in the story of Jacob and his brother Esau. Hear now these words. Jacob looked up, and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So Jacob divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? The Spirit of the living God fall fresh upon us and help us to understand the power and the importance of forgiveness. Amen. So if you're not familiar with the story of Esau and Jacob, you might take what I just read to you and you might think that it's the same kind of a joyous family reunion that happens when we see somebody that we love dearly for the first time in a while. This is what happened for Deborah and me when we got to go to Hawaii and go visit with Natalie. It used to be that you could meet people at the gate, and as soon as they walked off of the airplane, you'd be able to give hugs and kisses right there, right away. But now, thanks to the additional rules and regulations, you can't see each other until you get all the way down to baggage claim. But once we got to baggage claim and we were able to see Natalie and Zach, it was very much that hugs and kisses and so happy to see each other. But that's not what's going on in the story of Jacob and Esau. This is not a family reunion like what we experienced when we saw Natalie and Zach. To understand What's going on when Esau and Jacob see each other? We've got to step back and go back many years. In fact, we've got to go all the way back to when Jacob and Esau weren't even yet born. For you see, their mother, Rebecca, was pregnant with twins. And while they were in her womb, they were already wrestling with each other. And when the boys were born, Esau was born first, but just by a couple of minutes, because as soon as Esau came out, Jacob was holding on to Esau's heel, and he came out just behind. And every day from that day forward, they continued to wrestle with each other. The sibling rivalry between Esau and Jacob was unparalleled. Now Esau gets his name because when he was born, he was very ruddy, very red, and his hair was red, and Esau means to be red, and so that's where he gets his name. Jacob's name means the grabber or the one who takes what is not his. And so he is grabbing onto Esau's heel, trying to get what is not his. And so these two boys grow up constantly trying to beat one another out for their parents' undivided affection. 
but that's not how they grow up. Esau grows up, and he enjoys being out in the field. He is a hunter. He becomes very stout, very hairy, still very red. And Isaac, his dad, prefers Esau. Jacob, on the other hand, kind of skinny, not much hair, barely can grow a beard at all. He doesn't like to go out in the fields. He likes to stay in among the tents, and he becomes his mother, Rebecca's favorite. So here we have two brothers fighting against each other, and then two parents who are also, in a way, fighting against each other because they're all in this unhealthy family dynamic. And it stays unhealthy all through their growing up years, and The thing that Jacob really was frustrated by was that Esau gets the birthright. Now, the birthright was that the oldest son gets a double portion of the inheritance. So whenever daddy kicks the bucket, then the older child gets almost everything, and then the younger children have to settle for the scraps. And for Jacob, he doesn't really think it's fair that Esau gets it by two minutes. Now, you guys, you've probably heard the phrase, I'm hangry. I think Snickers kind of put this out there. That's when you're hungry, and so you're angry, and the two kind of go together. But if you eat something, then you aren't quite as angry anymore. Well, I want to give you a different word, and that word is hungrous. It's kind of like hangry, but this is you're so hungry that you are helpless, and then you don't make good decisions. Your thinking process isn't right. And one day, Esau is hungrous. He's incredibly hungry. He has been out in the field. He's been trying to get some game. He's been hunting and hunting to no avail. And he comes home, and he's weak, and he's starving. And there's Jacob. And he's got a fire going. He's got a pot in the fire. And Esau comes up, and, oh, wow, something smells really good. Jacob says, oh yeah, this is, this is red lentil stew. It's just about ready. And Esau's like, oh, I want me some of that. Jacob says, you can't have any. And Esau's like, what do you mean I can't have any? Jacob says, this is my food. If you want some of my stew, then you've got to sell me your birthright. Now Esau is hungry. He's not thinking well. He's so focused on the immediacy of the food that he says, what good is my birthright if I'm about to starve? Give me the food. Jacob says, no, you got to swear it. And so here's what the scripture says. So Esau swore an oath to Jacob, selling him his birthright. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew, and he ate and he drank, and then he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. He was hungry, not thinking clearly, and Jacob took advantage of that. So Esau, whose name means red, sold his birthright for a bowl of red stew, and Jacob, whose name means he grasps and takes not what is his, did exactly that. Both boys lived into their names. And if that's not bad enough, then you flash forward a few more years, and now Isaac is getting old. Isaac can't see very well. Isaac can't hear very well, and he thinks he's about to die. And so he calls Esau into the tent, and he says, my son, go and hunt and prepare me a savory meal that I can eat it and give you my blessing. Now, the blessing is probably even more important than the birthright. 
And so Esau goes to eagerly hunt and find some food to be able to give his dad a savory meal. But Rebekah, remember, Rebekah doesn't care much for Esau. She hears Isaac doing this, and so she calls Jacob and says, Jacob, I want you to pretend to be Esau. I want you to take this goat and prepare it as a savory meal. And Jacob was like, uh, Mom, look at me. I ain't got no hair. I'm not going to be able to pull off this kind of deception. Rebecca says, oh, don't worry about it. Here, I'll put this sheepskin on you and make you as hairy as your brother. You go in there. And so Jacob goes in and says, my father, <clears throat> my father, I have your meal for you. Now, Isaac's not quite sure, but he eventually is convinced that this really is Esau. And so he gives his blessing to Jacob. And then Jacob gets the blessing, and he immediately hightails it out of there. You can understand why. And no sooner is Jacob out than Esau comes in, and Esau says, Here, Dad, I've brought you your savory meal. May you give me my blessing. And Isaac is like, uh, What? I've already given my blessing. And here is what the Scripture says. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. But Isaac said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? This is the second time he's taken advantage of me. He took my birthright, and now he's taken my blessing. And then he asked, Haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have made him lord over you and have made all his relatives his servants and I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me too. Then Esau wept aloud. And then Genesis twenty-seven forty-one says, Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Do you think Esau has any fondness at this point for Jacob? Absolutely not. He is out to get rid of this guy who has stolen not only his birthright, but now his blessing. But once again, Rebecca has heard this, and so she tells Jacob, you need to get out of here. Your brother is ready to kill you. And so Jacob leaves Canaan where he's made his home. And he goes back to Haran, which is where Rebekah is from, and he goes to his uncle Laban's house. And he's there for at least 14 years. He shows up and he meets this really pretty thing called Rachel. And he says, I want to marry her. And Laban says, well, if you want to marry her, then you've got to work for me for seven years. And so he does. He works. They have the wedding. He goes to bed that night with his new bride, and he wakes up in the morning, and he rolls over. <gasps> it's not Rachel. It's her older sister, Leah. And Jacob gets up out of bed, and he goes to his father-in-law and says, what are you doing to me? I meant to marry Rachel. And Laban says, well, you know, Leah's the older daughter. I couldn't embarrass her by marrying off Rachel first. So if you want to work for me for another seven years, I'll let you have both. And so he does. So at least 14 years go by, and in these 14 years, Jacob gets some maturity into him. He encounters God. He experiences God in his life. He builds up a large family, but eventually the time comes that he recognizes that he can't stay with Uncle Laban anymore. He's got to go back home. 
And so he gathers everybody up and they make the journey back. But he's on his way going back to Canaan when word reaches him, hey, your brother Esau, he knows you're on the way. And he's got 400 men. Now Jacob is thinking, 400 men? The only reason that he would have 400 men is if he plans to attack me and kill us all. And so he divides everybody up. And you notice he puts the servant girls and their kids first. And then Leah and her kids. And then finally Rachel and Joseph in the, in the hopes that by the time Esau and his bloodthirsty 400 men get to Rachel and, Esau, Rachel and Jacob that, that maybe they're not going to be quite so ready to kill. And he himself, he goes up in front and when he sees Esau and those 400 men all along the horizon, he's like, and it, the Bible doesn't say it this way, but, but I can almost guarantee you that He's bowing. Oh, please don't kill me. Oh, really, please, please, please don't kill me. And he's coming forward and he's, he's bowing. He is in fear of his life. He doesn't know what Esau is going to do, but Esau sees him and he runs and he puts his arms around him. Now, Jacob expected Esau to draw a sword and slice through him or to pick up his club and hammer on top of him. But what does Esau do? He comes and he grabs him and he hugs him and he kisses him and he weeps on his neck. It's forgiveness. Forgiveness. In spite of everything that Jacob had done to him, Esau chose to forgive. And we know that this lasted, this reconciliation kept going because in Genesis 35, 27 through 29, it says, Isaac lived 180 years. Then he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of years. And his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. It wasn't Esau buried him. It wasn't Jacob buried him. It was that both brothers together buried their father. Now, why does forgiveness surprise us? It doesn't just surprise us when we look at these old stories from the Scriptures. It surprises us when we see it even in our own lifetime. Do you remember a number of years ago when the guy went into the school in Pennsylvania, the Amish school, and he started shooting up those children? And four young girls die. And what does the Amish community impacted by this tragedy do? They immediately say, we forgive him. And they even went and visited with him in the prison. And the media was full of all of these stories about how can those people forgive the man who did such a heinous crime. Or a couple of years ago when a white man went into an historically black church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, sat there through a Wednesday night Bible study for an hour and as they are getting ready to close in prayer, he suddenly pulls out a gun and he shoots the minister. He starts shooting other people because he wants to start a race war between whites and blacks. And what do the people of the African Methodist Episcopal Church do? They forgive him. Forgiveness always surprises us. 
It's not what we expect. It's not what we necessarily do. And the reason for this, according to Gil Mertz, who wrote Forgive Your Way to Freedom, he says forgiveness goes against every fiber of our flesh. Forgiveness is not instinctive, and it's against our nature. Forgiveness is a heavenly nature. Alexander Pope was right when he said, to err is human, to forgive is divine. It may be against our nature, but it is what Jesus expects us to do. Jesus clearly taught time and time again about the importance of forgiveness and how we receive the forgiveness of our sins from our Heavenly Father. So the question is, if this is against our nature, how Do we do it? Has anybody else got that question? How do I forgive? Well, Chip Ingram, a pastor out in California, says that there is a three-stage process of forgiveness. The first stage of forgiveness is the decision to forgive. That we make that decision in our minds, we say... I forgive that person for what happened to me. That's stage one. That's our part. We draw the line in the sand and say, I'm not going over there. I'm going to stay over here on the side of forgiveness. Now, just because our mind says it, do our emotions automatically go along? No. We are in this battle between I want to forgive and yet I have all of the emotional experience that goes along with the pain, the hurt, the anger, the whatever it might be that is there. And that brings us to stage two. And stage two is forgiving. Stage one is forgive. Stage two is forgiving. It's the ing-ing of it all. And that means that that's the time period that God starts working in us so that our emotional experience begins to match our decision about forgiving. And the only thing that we have in stage two as a resource is prayer. Pray for the one that you need to forgive. That's why Jesus said, you have heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward do you get? Are not even tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. My friends, when we're in stage two, forgiving, that's when we do what Jesus said. We pray for our enemies, and we pray that God is going to work. Now, often, our initial prayer might be something like, God, smite them. God, they hurt me. Will you hurt them? But that's not what Jesus means when he says, pray for those. God doesn't want us to be praying for vengeance because that's not our place. We need to be at the point that when we hear that something good has happened to that other person, instead of it making our blood boil, we're able to rejoice. And stage two might take a long time. It's not instant. But as we pray, God does work and eventually we reach stage three forgiven when we have let go 
of all of the emotional experience and it no longer bothers us when we hear that something good happened to that other person. They often say, forgive and forget. We don't really forget. It's all still there, but it no longer has hold of us. It doesn't grab us and pull us back into that experience anymore. It's like when I did with Nora. Forgiven, the handcuffs are gone. My friends, we need to have ourselves committed to forgive because God has forgiven us. Amen. As Jesus hung on that cross, beaten and bloodied, fighting for his every breath, he breathed, Father, forgive them. My friends, we are forgiven, and that frees us, and that is good news. So let us be committed to being a forgiving people to share that good news. So go forth from this place, forgiven, forgiving, in Jesus' name, amen.